Good morning. Welcome to Scarborough Community Alliance Church. We are so glad that you can join us in person or online as we enter into our second week of Missions Month. This morning, we have our guest speaker, Suresh, who will be sharing God's word with us this morning. My hope is that we do not leave the same as we came in. I pray that this morning be spirit-filled and that the spirit may lead us to respond as a church and individually where God has placed us. Please join me in worshiping our God. Please rise. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Spirit, Lord, we Oh 
Can someone get the blinds? Is it very sorry, so sorry.
us pray. Father God, as we have just sang, we recognize that you are our loving and gracious God who created us and saved us from death. All our hope is in you. There is nothing that we can do or achieve on our own that is even close to what it is like to be accepted and loved by our King. As we continue our missions month, I pray that we recognize the skills and talents that you have given us and use them to glorify your name and be your witnesses wherever you have placed us. We thank you for allowing us to partner with you in reaching those who do not know you. I pray that you embolden us to exalt and proclaim your great name wherever you lead us. Amen. Isaiah 12, 4 to 6 reads, Give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Proclaim that his name is exalted. Sing praises to the Lord, for he has done gloriously. Let this be known in all the earth. Shout and sing for joy, O inhabitant of Zion, for great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel.
Please be seated. Children, you guys are dismissed. Enjoy your time learning about more about thankfulness this month. Now is the time for intercessory prayer. Let, let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for being a good, good, gracious king. Allow us, us to come to you as we are, Lord. Thank you for your love and for your faithfulness for hearing our prayer. We pray as we continue this missions month, we will come with an open heart to hear your calling for our lives. For us to extend your mercy and love wherever we are. For us to be willing to say yes in faith and in obedience in the midst of our own fears and worries and doubts. As we continue this, even for Remembrance Day weekend, we are reminded of the conflicts, the heartbreak, the lives lost still happening around the world. We pray for your peace and recon reconciliation to come. Even closer to home, in the midst of our own lives, in our own conflicts, dealing with sicknesses, sickness, job insecurities, or grief, we pray for your healing, your comfort, mending of broken relationships for you to provide in ways we can't even imagine. May we continue to fix our eyes on you, place our hope and trust in you alone. We lift up our staff and leadership into your hands. Pray for your protection as we know the enemy is always on the prowl. Pray for your wisdom and discernment for the nominating committee as they begin to work to search for elder nominees for the upcoming AGM. We lift Pastor Vic and Joyce into your hands as they enjoy this time of rest and restoration and reunion with their daughter and son-in-law on their vacation. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. This week's passage is from Acts chapter 18, verse 1 to 4, and 24 to 26. Acts chapter 18, verse 1 to 4, and 24 to 26. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth, and he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. And he went to see them. And because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers by trade. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade Jews and Greeks. Verse 24. Now a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was an eloquent man, competent in the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. Morning, church. As we continue on with our missions month today, I hope that you are all as blessed as I was with what Curtis Peters shared last week from 2 Timothy about disciples and multiplying disciples. This directly tied into our church's new vision, and that as our families and friends or others who have spoken God's truth into our lives did and shared their faith with us, we can continue to speak into the lives of those that God has placed around us. And then from there, they can continue to multiply it onto others. If you're not able to see that service or would like to see it again, just a reminder that uh, the service is still posted on our YouTube channel. Our speaker this week is Suresh Gunaratnam. I had the pleasure of meeting him and his wife uh, this morning for the first time, but I was very happy to hear that he has so many connections and many years of, of um, interaction with our church. He is a bivocational worker with the Alliance Canada, based at the head office in Mississauga, and in his role, he supports the global missions mobilization team spread across the country, a team of people who helps our local churches to remain and become more missional. In his tent-making role, Suresh is also a leadership development consultant with a leading global consultancy. 
Along with his wife Cheryl, Suresh served for 10 years in Istanbul, Turkey as tent makers. He continues to be engaged in the work in Turkey and his message today is entitled, Empowered to Influence. Please help me welcome Suresh. It is good to be here. And a few times back when I was here, you didn't have this kind of stand and my computer slipped and fell. And it was a Mac, so it didn't break. So I switched the computer, but you got a better stand. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, I, as uh, my, our partnership goes back to when some of your church members visited Turkey. And our kids were quite little at that time. Let me show how little they were. Um, you see the picture right there. That's the, oops, did I do something wrong? Okay. So this is where uh, the first day they are going to school. And in fact, uh, I was talking to Tim in the foyer. Tim remembered their names, Moses and Lysha, like this. Now Moses is 6'2", and he graduated last year, and he grew up, most of his formative years for both Moses and Lysha were in Istanbul, Turkey. And um, he got married March this year, and he lives in Windsor. He's 23. I never thought he will get married this early, but he did say when he was 18, he wants to be married after he graduates. And the, my wife and I reminded him, there's a small problem, you need somebody to marry. <laughs> but things worked out, he's married. And our daughter, Elisha, you see her there, and she moved to Netherlands. Uh, because um, she's doing a master's in law, in the international human rights law, and Netherlands is one of the best places to do it, and that's why she has gone there, and that has given us the excuse for Cheryl and I go there. In fact, we celebrated part of our 25th wedding anniversary over there, and we did a 120-kilometer walk, St. Cuthbert's Way, starting from Scotland to England. We walked f over five days, uh, completing in the in the Holy Island. That was one of the highlights this year. And the other picture you see a lot of people here, this one, um, you may recall, has Amanda visited here? She's your missions mobilizer for Eastern Canadian District. Uh, uh, Sam knows her on that. And, and other people in that picture, they are mobilizers in each of the district or province across Canada. I lead the team. The focus of the team is helping our churches continuously remain connected, like with the uh, Carol uh, Limbs and the Cats and others, because you are one of the churches, you are a missional church, but not all alliances are like, alliance churches are like that. So this group comes and helps the local churches to remain connected with the international workers or missionaries as we call them, uh, or we used to call them, and also help the churches to become more missional. So that's the group that I lead, that's half-time job. The other half-time, I work with mainly corporate clients, but also with some uh, uh, non-profit clients. Mainly I do leadership development workshops for one of the largest uh, global companies. We are in the top 10 globally. And this is one of the sample clients. I, I put them there because they take me to a very nice wine tasting place in Niagara on the lake. I didn't say I drink, but I said it's a very nice place, amazing food and everything. And last year they took me to Guatemala on that. So I love this client. So that's why I put that client, even though I could have put 30 other clients. So you may be wondering, so that's my daughter-in-law who is standing with my son. He's, uh, Sam, you're 6'3", six, 6'4", six, around there, similar height as Sam, and they got married in March. Right next to that picture, you see an ATM machine. It's not accident I put it there, and I'm not asking for your money either. The reason I put it there is when we were in Turkey, in Turkey, most of the ATM machines are connected to a wall. Like here, you go into a bank, you open the door, and the ATM machines are there. In Turkey, the bank is normally in a corner, or even if there is no bank, on the wall, in the middle of the city center, you will see four ATM machines uh, connected to different banks. And you put the card, you take the money, and our son saw that. 
And he said, when he grows older, he's going to get a card. So that way he can get the, all the money he can get. That's all. Life is simple. All you need is a card. When you get older, you just a, get a card. Then all the, the, everything is solved. Thankfully, he got over that mature stage to another level of maturity. He realizes he has to work, actually. The money has to go into a bank before he can use the card. So today, I want to talk about uh, how do we actually prepare ourselves with missions in our mind. Whether you go like Kat, I was with Kat, by the way, in Bali in January. And amazing time we had reconnecting because I also worked with her in the national head office. And thank you for the way that you continue to support our workers over there because that's very evident in the way they function there, the support you have. I'm not just talking about the money you give. That's very important. But even more important, the prayer support and the fellowship you continue to extend because we get lonely when we are there. And you are one of those churches, you're really supporting them well. So let's go back to what I was saying. My son, he thought all you need is a card, life problems are solved. <laughs> but you and I know all of us have what I call a five loaves and two fish. Every one of us have it. We all have different kinds of five loaves and two fish. And that's what we bring it to the table. And on the other side, there are needs. Like you see on the screen, uh, there are needs that are there the better you can match your five loaves and two fish to the needs out there, you have got a good job. <laughs> you may like what you have in your hand, but if somebody is not willing to pay on the other side, or if the community does not need that, you don't have a job, you have a nice hobby. <laughs> so typically, you bring this, you study, you get experience, you do internships, all those things, all that you bring to the table. On the other side, there is need. When these two are matched, it's very good. You got a good job. But longer you live, you begin to realize jobs alone may not give you what you really like to do. I started my career in finance. Seventh or eighth year, I knew they will kill me or I will kill them given my personality because in finance, you have to see black and white. My wife is totally in that, not because she's white, but she's like very black and very white. I see far too many gray areas. That does not fit in finance. And the other reason is for me, very early on, without me even rec recognizing, uh, there were people who saw the skill within me developing other people. So I used to get a lot of invitation to come and serve in volunteer community, uh, sorry, committees to develop others. I didn't realize that. But when I was in Turkey, one of my language tutors told me, Suresh, you are naturally developing people. You should get into developing other people. And all of a sudden, I begin to see there's another circle that's important for you and I. Can you move slide once more, please? Thank you. Okay, there's another circle. So when you match the need and the talent, that's a job. But when you bring in the passion into what you do, you love waking up. You may be tired end of the day, but you are very excited what happened during the day. That's what I call passion. When these three circles comes together, not only you have a job, you have something that you enjoy. Doesn't mean every day is beautiful, every day is uh, lovely, but most of the time you love what you do. That's the third circle we bring in, in uh, on that. And there's a fourth circle that involves a little more tricky. This circle is what I call it is this the right thing to do at this time? I'm going to use Tim's example. I didn't get his permission, but it's easy to ask for forgiveness than permission. So I knew Tim before he got married, right? Well, way back. Pun? Tim, Tim, yeah, Tim. 
See, when you marry this long, you get corrected very often. This is our 25th year, okay? Doesn't matter whether you stand here or you are in the kitchen. So, <laughs> so Tim, I knew before, was, when we met, I don't think Alex was in your radar, Alexander. Or well, maybe she was, I didn't know. But he, he remembers my kids like this. And he works for a software company that's based in US, if I'm right. And one of the things I discovered in this stage he, may, he can easily switch jobs and get more money because people need his, with his skills. He can get. But he, one of the reasons I'm certain he's choosing to stay in this job because the fourth circuit, this is the right time because his kids are seven and three. Correct? At this time, taking them to school, hands-on caring for your kids as equally important as the other three circles. So that's what I call it the fourth circle, conscience. So you can see there are things that you and I may want to do. There's a need in the marketplace. You have the five loaves and two fish for God to multiply and meet the need. You may be even excited and you are passionate about it. This may not be the right time to do that. So that's the conscience part you discern in community, in word and the spirit of God. That's the fourth circle. So when these four circles, when they converge, the closer they become, you are no longer doing a job. Now you are bringing contribution to the environment wherever you are. Doesn't matter whether you are in Turkey or whether you are in downtown Toronto or you are spending time in front of a screen, your clients and everybody is out there. But these four, the closer they come, that's the contribution you and I bring. Let me explain. This is not just in job, it's in every area of life. So we lived in a townhouse until a year ago. Across from a townhouse, in another townhouse, there were 13 international students, 13 girls in three bedroom, main floor, and a basement, two washrooms, 13 girls. Often you'll see them outside the house, even middle of the winter, talking on the phone, because inside the house there's no privacy, nothing. And there were cockroaches, you name it, everything was there. And my wife befriended, and she invited another person called Hannah. They connected because they were all girls. It was appropriate for her to befriend. And long story short, we were having Wednesday nights dinners at our house. So there's a need there. We have the five loaves and two fish, in this case, literally feeding them, and also the sharing the love of Christ in that process. And we are passionate about equipping the, the young people. This is the next generation leaders. They are coming from all different backgrounds. And that was the right thing to do, consciously. Do you know what? That one meal a week where they don't have to cook, come and sit in our living room, have fun, have games after dinner, and go back. That's the right thing for to do. At times, is it inconvenience? Of course. But God made it bigger. So we moved to another place because we were infested with mice in our place. <laughs> and we also reached out to the Turkish people in, our com in tr uh, Greater Toronto. And that's not an acceptable thing, having mice in the house. We tried to get rid of it, they wouldn't go. The food was too good in our house. So we moved. And in the new place, it's a detached place. And we are continuing, now we have switched to Monday nights, the international student nights, twice a month. So same four things are at play. So when we do this in the name of Christ, then it's no longer just a contribution. You are becoming a blessing to the others. So when you hear the word blessing, I don't know for you, the worst comes to my mind, maybe because of the, some of the courses I took at seminary. By the way, Eileen, my wife and I, we had... Uh, together in seminary. This is one of our other connections in this church. So when in this passage you see, God is calling Abraham. He's saying, go from your country. Because at that time, staying together with your clan is the self safest thing to do. Nowadays it's different. We go to places. You stay with your extended family and everybody. That's the safety. And God is saying, go from here to a place I will take you. He doesn't even give an address where you are going. 
And God's thing is saying, I'm going to bless you and you will be a blessing. And you will be a blessing to the nations. And this covenantal relationship, the covenant meaning God initiates, we participate, and often it's a blessing to us, but the key thing is it's a blessing through us. It's not so much about Abraham, it's a blessing through Abraham. So when you see the four circles earlier, I want you to look at the same way, is how are we blessing the people in the way God has given you the talents, your five loaves and two fish, and he also brings different needs. You and I cannot meet all the needs. We are not meeting all the needs of the international students. We are reaching out to this handful of people God has brought into our lives. And the more you do what God is bringing, you also get passionate about it. And then, of course, is it the right thing to do? When we do this, then you and I are fulfilling the promise God gave through Abraham. In fact, the, the, what we call the Great Commission passage from Matthew, um, this passage is very much based on Abrahamic covenant. In this passage, you see here, when they saw Jesus, here the, the timing of this is after Jesus' suffering, his death and resurrection. Matthew 28 context is that. So Jesus is coming on and off, appearing to disciples and others. That's the context. So he's not all the time with them because he is risen. So if this is one of those instances they see Jesus, he's appearing. This is like not business as usual. <laughs> he is appearing, and when they saw Jesus, they worshipped him. And Jesus said, all authority in heaven and earth and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son. You know the rest of the verse. There are a couple of parallel things I want you to bring from these two passages. The previous passage, it's a call to be a blessing to the nations for Abraham. Uh, we don't have time to go through. There are several following passages in Genesis. Every time Abraham kept moving, because God didn't give the final destination, he kept Abraham moving. He did one thing, this didn't matter where he went. He built an altar and he worshiped. <laughs> So the call to be a blessing is in the context of worship. <laughs> you, I, we cannot truly be a blessing to the nations when we don't enjoy our fellowship with Jesus on an ongoing basis. And same thing, when, when, the, the, when the disciples encountered the risen Christ, they worshipped him. In that context, the Great Commission passage was given. Often we talk about Great Commission passage, we don't look at the previous verse. The worship is the central thing. When we enjoy worship, you don't have to tell me, hey, tell the others. We used to go to dim sum places, uh, lunchtime from seminary days. And we will come back and we will tell others, hey, that's a great place in this corner. Prices are good. We were students, so price is a problem. So prices are good, good portions, and they bring it quickly. Nobody told us to tell that to other players. They didn't give us because we enjoyed that food. We enjoyed in community. We are telling others. So you and I need to ask, am I encountering the risen Christ just the way disciples encountered on a regular basis and enjoying him in fellowship. When I enjoy declaring that to the nations is a very natural outcome. In fact, this is predicted and said even before Christ came, sing the praises of the Lord enthroned in Zion, Proclaim among the nations what he has done. So this is not just it started in Matthew. This is back in Psalms. David, full of joy. David is a man who messed up big time. More than us. None of us actually, hopefully, you didn't. You didn't kill somebody to take somebody's wife. That's what David did. Yet, yet when David repented 
and turned around. He was known as a man after God's own heart. I really believe, do you know why? Because he loved worship. That's why the, we have the book of Psalms. It's a story of worship through the Psalms. All, every Psalm is, is fuels us to worship. Sometimes we complain to God in the Psalm. Where are you, God, in the midst of it? But it's still done in the context of worship. So the first challenge for you and I, in, not just in the missions month, ongoing, doesn't matter whether you go overseas like uh, cat or uh, the limbs. <laughs> in your context, are you living a life of worship? That's number one. Number two, my question is, regardless what you do, when you bring these four things continuously together, you are being a blessing with the five loaves and two fish we all have. What Sam has in his hands, his five loaves and two fish, is different from mine. Based on that, where God has taken Sam is to different places than where I go. But end of the day, are we being a blessing to the people out there through the five loaves and two fish? And there is spiritual need, there is physical need, emotional need, and all the other needs. And there is passion God gives in what we do. And sometimes we have to do a little extra work to find that place. And then there is other place. Is this the right time? Like the Tim's example. He can move to another job, but right now in his job, with the kids being that little, this is the right place. Work online. You are depriving of community. Yet right now we are, they are families. This is the right time. On that. So, end of the day, the call for you and I is these two things, worship and declare his praises. And the way he has equipped us to do is through these four things. He has given you and I, he has empowered us to influence. You can influence better when you have a blessing to the people. You can preach to them. Do you know what? More and more I'm recognizing my, the way I behave and bless other people speaks far more loud than what I say. I need to bring in the name of Jesus into it. But it's much easier to bring in when they already feel I am blessed by you. Let me give you a story. It just happened a month ago. I was in Istanbul. I'm still connected with Istanbul going back and forth. I'll be back there end of this month. So I, normally I stay in a hotel because clients pay for it. And this time I was just there for two days. I chose to stay with my uh, the partner, my business partner whom I brought in. She runs and she and her husband have this beautiful house. I stay there and first, and first time I'm meeting the parents of both sides. And I thought there's already their family and four extra people and me. But I had my upper room upstairs in that. And I didn't realize uh, they were watching me. I didn't realize that. The reason I'm saying is the second day after lunch, my business partner's mother, she called me and said, Suresh, I want to talk to you. This is all happening in Turkey. She said, you are different. Then I asked my daughter, why is Suresh different? And do you know what she said? Suresh and Cheryl, that's my wife, they pray and do everything in, through prayer. We may, I made more mistakes in Istanbul in that part than any other place, to be honest with you. But it's not the perfection God is looking for. It's are you wanting to be transparent and authentic and being a person of worship? People see that. Turkey is 99.9% uh, Muslim followers. But for them, when they see somebody praying and there is cause and effect, things change around, they don't deny your life. So that's what she was telling me. And she said, I heard through my daughter that you and your wife, you pray for everything. <laughs> Number two, she I don't know why she talked about the, our kids, Moses and Elisha. And that gave me an opportunity to explain why we named them the names we gave them. Moses is the person who leads the uh, people from a place of bondage to a place of worship. So when we were praying for naming for Moses, we sensed that what God giving, it's our parental, spiritual, wishful thinking of who he is to become. <laughs> it's lead people from a place of bondage to a place of worship. We 
named Lysha because that is in Hebrew, God is my salvation. And to this day, that's what I continue to pray because she had more challenges physically in other ways than an average person. Just to give you an idea, four surgeries on her knee in three and a half years, and still she's in pain, but she's much better. She has a lot more challenges. So for me, that name represents God is her salvation. So I shared all this with her, with a Muslim person. She started crying. <laughs> she was in tears. Because <laughs> something connected within her, and all this I'm doing in the name of Jesus. And do you know where it came? It came in the place of my contributions as a tent maker, not as a traditional full-time missionary. Nothing wrong. We need pastors. We need full-time missionaries. Don't get me wrong. But 90% of us here, we will never be a full-time pastor or a missionary. 90% of us will be what I call is you and I are in marketplace where we engage with people. And that's where you and I are called to bring our five loaves and two fish because God has empowered us so that we can influence him. We are not called to convert people. We influence people through our behavior and then the words come. When we do that, they will ask questions, and there are other times I get to speak into their lives. So the passage earlier, Tim read, this is the passage. In this passage, Paul is leaving Athens, and he's connecting with two people called Aquila and um, Priscilla. Priscilla and Aquila. Am I reading at the right place? Yes, okay. And it said they are tent makers like him. You know Paul's profession. Paul is one of the well-trained, he went to the best of seminaries and the best of teachers, Gamaliel. That's where Paul was educated. But it was a tradition among Jewish people, especially for men at that time, you always had another skill that you could do with hands-on. But this is a tricky profession, what Paul is doing. Do you know why? Do you know what tent making is? You work with leather. Do you know what leather is? Dead animal skin. You don't touch when you're a Pharisee of Pharisees. That's unclean. But God has put Paul in a situation where he has the skills to make tents. He didn't learn. He is a fellow tent maker like Priscilla and Aquila. And in that marketplace, there's a need. He's not pretending to make tents. He's actually making tents, and they are doing business in the marketplace. But there's also a synagogue there. That's a, that's, it's not a Jewish town. It's a Hellenistic town. A lot of Greek people are there. These are the people who were already drawn to Yahweh, the, the, the holy God. They don't have full understanding, but they are drawn to him. And that's the place God is engaging Paul because Paul is very passionate about persuading others. The passion. Is it the right thing to do? Making tents where you are actually desecrating yourself, working with leather. In that time, that was the right thing to do. And that's what Paul is doing. So that's the top part of the passage. Um, the first four verses. Paul and Aquila in community, praying together, worshiping together, but fully engaged in the marketplace like 95% of us. Then they are doing something else too. Later on, they leave there. They go to another town. And here they are encountering Apollos. Apollos is coming from one of the top centers of education, Alexandria. That was established in Egypt. In fact, at that time, Alexandria was far most uh, popular in terms of education, culture, and everything than Cairo. And that's where he is coming from. So he is like more like, unlike Paul, in this case, he's a tent making thing. He is coming at this time from a very educational background, very good head knowledge, but he was lacking a few things. And guess who is teaching? Aquila and Priscilla is helping him to know about the baptism of the Holy Spirit because he knew the baptism of John the Baptist, but not the baptism through the Holy Spirit. He is being equipped to minister. So what we are seeing here is the community coming together 
community that is rooted in worship through word and Holy Spirit. And they are using the skills that they have. They are five loaves and two fish. In doing so, they are blessing those people in the marketplace. But they are also equipping people like Apollos to become better marketplace engagement people. So, for me, this morning, I really want to ask you, is let God decide where you need to go or where you need to stay. But are you truly aware of what are the five loaves and two fish he has given you? That's the question I'm asking you. Because sometimes it takes a process to discover. Like for me, my language tutor in Turkey saying, Suresh, you, you are good in equipping others. You should get into leadership development. Even though I have had others talk about it, but this guy hit it on the nail. That's discovering, hey, what you have and what you need to continue to sharpen. Sometimes what we have is more like an unpolished diamond that needs some polishing. <laughs> Need some equipping. That's where the experience comes. Mentoring comes. So we need that mentoring. This is where your community is so crucial. Then you look at where God has already placed you. That's where the need is. And the passion that helps. Then you need to ask under the spirit of God, is this the right thing to do? At the, and is it the right time to do? So when these four come together then you are being a child of Abraham, a blessing where God has blessed you continuously. And this is very much connected to your church as the four things that I was shared with. That's the four core values. The first one being devoted to the authority of the word of God. A lot of the things that we have discerned in our lives, whether to stay or go, stay in Turkey, come back, has been guided by three things between Cheryl and I. Prayer, word of God, and the community. I still remember Cheryl coming and saying after uh, helping another couple, they were moving back to U.S., uh, Hunt, God is telling us to go back. And Cheryl doesn't use the God thing Lightly. I, I knew she's hearing God because she is immersed in prayer and in the word. Now, then we are exploring. So what are you hearing? And we are bouncing with the community. So this is one of your important core values, devoted to the authority of God's word and spirit-empowered community. So more this kind of things at the individual level, as a community you become. Same, are you seen as a church that is planted here or are you seen as a blessing to this community or both? Because there are churches, like the church I come from, it's Rexdale Alliance Church. And somebody challenged us in our 60th anniversary, are you seen as Rexdale's church or are you seen as Rexdale Alliance Church? Rexdale Alliance Church is the location. Rexdale's church is others seeing you as a blessing to the community. Because community has needs. <laughs> and you bring your talent collectively, just as individually we bring, collectively. And are you passionate about influencing this neighborhood as well as your individual workplace and schools and universities? So that's the challenge I'm posing before you. And this is very much connected to the core values. And the other one you have said is as a core value, being rooted in prayer. And uh, yeah, th those four things, which one am I missing? Uh, doing life authentically together. And I really believe uh, we become authentic when we individually and collectively follow this thing, what God has given us. But I want to bring some warnings too, because anytime any framework like this, we have a tendency, especially in North America, we can privatize it very quickly. We can privatize at individual level, we can privatize as a church. This is me and my community, we'll come together. Careful, there are a few things you and I need to ask, are we truly being a blessing? God called Israel as a nation to be a blessing. And this is the warning God is giving to Israel. Take a look at this. This is Isaiah 1. 
God is in fact calling them a rebellious nation because they have slipped away from being a blessing. They made it all about themselves. They are no different than us. Sometimes we have the same temptation. We make the family all about ourselves. We make the church all about ourselves. But it's actually, yes, we are being blessed. We are called to worship, but it's not just about us. It's about we becoming a vessel to be a blessing to the others. So that's the warning. And the same warning Jesus gave us in uh, Matthew. People did a lot of miraculous things in the name of Jesus. They may have even started churches, but at that time, Jesus is saying, I don't know you. <laughs> People did amazing things in the name of Jesus. So it's not like God didn't use. Just because God is using us doesn't mean you and I have the fulfilled contribution of worshiping and declaring his praises. So one of the tests you and I need to ask is, hey, am I reaching out to the causes of the community around, or am I just waiting here? If you come to my church, I will minister to you. Don't get me wrong. There's a place to invite them here, but we are also called to go there and be a blessing. That's what he, he has empowered you and I uh, to do that. So, before I close, I really want to uh, bring to application some of the things that in a group like this, we are all in different places. So I want to uh, ask you to do something. It's a little personal, but it's not private because I'm going to pray for you at the end of it. So if you can, because some of us have a hard time closing our eyes, if you can uh, close your eyes, and the first question I want to ask you is, are you encountering the risen Christ on a daily basis? Because when they saw Christ, they fell at his feet and they worshipped. Some of you here, you have not encountered Christ yet. You have Christ that has been passed on through your parents or somebody else. So if you're in that category, uh, with the rest of you, eyes closed. If you say, I am yet to encounter Christ. I know Christ, I sing about Christ, but I haven't encountered Christ in the way it's described. Just raise your hand so I could pray for you. Others don't need to look at you. Just be honest before God. If you are in a place you still have not encountered Christ, raise your hand, I want to pray for you. Okay, thank you. I see your hand. Then the second thing is some of us, we have encountered Christ, but we don't have the daily encounter both in the word and in the spirit. We are more dabbling in worship on Sunday mornings and maybe small groups than living a life of worship as Abraham did. So if you need to repent and get back to encountering the crucified risen Christ, Please raise your hand up that it's a sign before God. I am not happy with status quo. I want to have daily encounters. Thank you. I see your hands. Thank you. And then all of us need to examine. Feel free to open your eyes. How do I engage individually and collectively for what God is calling us? Because... The key reason God is calling us is, it's not even about the lost. <laughs> the lost is important, but primarily, he wants, he wants us to delight in him. That's the worship. Because when we delight, we declare to the other people. <laughs> so, let me close in a word of prayer. And uh, the, the verse I want to leave with you is this. Uh, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. That's the day it's coming where we all will be there in his presence. Until then, we need what we continue to do, bringing our five loaves and fish before God. That's our talent. And there are needs around us, both locally and globally, and then when we connect these two with the Spirit of God guiding us, we get the passion for what we do, and also we know we are doing the right thing. Then we are being the blessing to the nations, both near and far. 
Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord. Uh, this is a church in so many ways. You have placed this um, like a light on a hill in a place of darkness. We hear more bad stories in Scarborough, in this area, all kinds of things, Lord. But yet you have preserved this body of Christ because you have blessed them so they can be a blessing both within these four walls but also outside these four walls. Thank you, Lord. Even setting aside these uh, weekend services for missions months shows this, uh, this body of Christ's commitment to missions. But I pray, Lord, that you will fuel this fire. So it's not just these four weekend services that represents their missional commitment, but just as the disciples encountered you and fell at your feet on a daily basis, both in their individual settings and collective groups, this body of Christ will continue to be a blessing and a channel of blessing to the others. Thank you, Lord. We are not doing this in our own strength. This is what is your desire for us. Therefore, you empower us through your Holy Spirit. So, Spirit of God, we invite you to continue to fill us so that we become your channels of blessing, influencing the world out there which is still in darkness. In Jesus' name I pray. Please rise as we re respond in song.
deserving Jesus your name holds everything I need and I will live to carry your compassion to love a world that's broken to be your hands and feet and I will give Indeed, we um, are so blessed to be able to be Jesus' hands and feet. And so, um, Love in Action this month, we will be going downtown um, to partner with the Dale. And so, as you have read in the news and updates, uh, we are at full capacity. So, if you were still thinking about registering to come, um, you can't. You can't. <laughs> But it doesn't mean that you cannot. Um, it means that there's room for you to grab a pair, a, a, a thing of socks or underwear um, because there is a huge need, especially now that it's getting cold. Costco, you know, uh, what is this, George? Um, but Walmart. Hmm? Walmart. Walmart, yes. So, you know, if you're going shopping this week, please just grab another, you know, men or women, um, Make sure they're, they're thick socks, okay? Because they really need, they really need this downtown. Um, so those of you who have registered to cook or bake and come downtown to serve, you will be uh, getting an email from me this week. Okay, thank you. Thanks so much, Ivy. <laughs> I'd encourage you to stand for the benediction. Let's pray together. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for living and residing with each and every one of these believers. Thank you, God the Father, for sending Jesus, for creating this world that we live in. And we inhabit every corner and every aspect of this world. Thank you, Jesus Christ, for the new life that we can live because of your death and your resurrection. We thank you so much for your equipping and enabling of your people for your mission here on this earth. We ask that you would continue to give us spiritual eyes to see the gifts and passions that we have been given and the places and positions that we have been placed in order that we may be a blessing to those around us, to draw others to a saving knowledge of who you are and that through our participation in the work of God that we would have an even deeper participation in the fellowship of the, of the Holy Spirit, and in the power of our God and Savior, the lover of our soul. And so we, we now go and are dismissed with your blessing, but let me read this blessing from Hebrews 13. Now may the God of peace who brought, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. This concludes our service. Thank you so much for joining us. We pray that you have a great rest of your Sabbath. Take care. <laughs>